So anyway, we can start now by doing a meditation. The meditation is a pretty usual meditation, but nevertheless, sometimes you can go really, really deep and we can see how it goes. So, if you'd like to get yourself, first of all, in a comfortable position. We do have things like cushions. If you'd like to sit on cushions, I've got two cushions behind me, my goodness. Still some more people coming in, so please ask people, can you be on time? I know one of the reasons why people come in late these days is because they don't go flying overseas anymore where you have to get in on time, otherwise you get not on the aircraft. So please, if you can, come in now. So with my mask on, can you hear me okay? You can, in the back. People aren't saying anything, perhaps they can't. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, if you'd like to close your eyes, and with your eyes closed to bring attention to how your body feels right now. This is the first arising of mindfulness when we meditate to how our body feels. Because of that, it does help to close your eyes first. With your eyes closed, you can be much more sensitive to your bodily feelings. And that gives you the opportunity to make sure you are in a good physical position. So I just already noticed that the cushion is not uh, in the proper place. I'm going to just fidget a little bit. It's better to fidget at the beginning, get it comfortable so you can be still at the end. With your eyes closed, you can be a little bit more specific with your awareness. So put your awareness on your legs to begin with. How do your legs feel? Can you make them more comfortable by adjusting something? If you don't pay enough attention to your bodily posture when you begin meditation, what happens is that your body gets stiff, aching, painful, and either you have to move or you carry on enduring, and then meditation doesn't really work for you. It's not that you can't meditate, but you meditate it without enough preliminary attention on your body. So please get the body nice and comfy. First of all, your legs. Can you improve them? Your butt. And I do spend special attention on my bottom because too many times, especially if I sit long periods of time, if I don't get that right to begin with, it gets sore. In the old days, my legs used to go to sleep. They become numb. And that was a concern. So get sure, my, make sure my butt is really comfy on the cushion. And then my back. People do have sore backs. Why? Sometimes there are accidents happen. But if you have got a reasonably good back, then sit in a position where your back is comfy. 
are not sort of comfortable for a moment, but comfortable for half an hour, the meditation time. I feel my back and I move it around to get it in the optimum position. And then my shoulders, make sure my shoulders are nice and loose. So there's no pain possible to grow in my shoulders. And then just down my arms, making sure my elbows and wrists and hands are all in a good position. And if you do have any sore part of the body, you can experiment by just focusing on that sore part of the body. And focusing and you look deeper into it and give it some kindness. Kindness is what relaxes everything. You're warm to that feeling, even though it might be a bit sore or painful. When you're warm to it, it gets looser, more peaceful. And you realize that that little, what we think is a preparation, is a great part of insight, understanding, and how to allow your body to be peaceful. I was careful with the words, how to allow it to be peaceful, not how to make it peaceful, how to allow it. And then go back up to your shoulders and your, your neck and throat. For anybody who has itchy throat or a sore neck, to make sure that the neck is not in pain. I usually, you may notice me, I just move my head from the left to the right, backwards and forwards, to get the optimum position for my head on top of my neck. How does it feel? And now my head and neck feel balanced. And lastly, I, as you've heard me before, I go to my face. How does my face feel? Especially the muscles around the eyes and the mouth. Because that's where some emotions manifest on your face. is how people can tell whether you're afraid or whether you are happy or whether you are angry. It is how your facial muscles are configured. And by learning just how to relax all those muscles, you can actually learn how to lessen many of those negative emotions. When our face is at ease, the emotions also calm down. And we have a greater sense of peace in our body to start with. And at this point, I just turn to my awareness to the whole body, just all linked up together, joined together, making sure that it's all at ease. And I do enjoy literally doing this part of the meditation because my body is relaxed and is at ease. I just got to relax it a bit more now, I just adjusted my robe. When the body's at ease, I know it's at ease enough because it feels delightful. A sense of joy, happiness comes up. And a very wonderful insight happens now. So when 
the body feels peaceful, joyful, delightful. The peace, the relaxation deepens. It's like the joy, the delight takes the body into a more relaxed situation. And you may notice that this is a little hint for you, an insight. If ever you can't sleep at night because of the heat or noise or something, you can get some relaxation in your body and it's delightful, you'll soon fall asleep. And by being mindful of the body, relaxing it part by part is a wonderful way. But anyway, once the body feels delightful and relaxed, it's like the preparation, not just bodily, but your mindfulness is strong enough your care is strong enough to go into the inner world of the mind. How peaceful are you right now? How does it feel? Not in your body, in your mind. And by practicing this little method, you will find that when you can see your mind, it is actually not scary it's actually quite peaceful and joyful and peace is delightful. What is delightful is easy to focus on and the delight, the peace only happens now. Straight away it helps you focus on the present moment. If the present moment is silent enough, in other words, the delight will overcome that your tendency to think and to plan or work it all out. Shh. See if you can learn how to feel and listen and to know without giving things a name. What are you experiencing right now? How do you feel? Can you be kind to this? So just like relaxing your body, you relax your mind.
and see if you can bring enough peace to your mind right now in silence to feel, experience for yourself the joy of a mind which doesn't have to think about things which doesn't have to remember the past or worry about the future which is just here Yeah, there are things to worry about, but you can do that later. There may be things to recall, but you can recall it later. Now it's meditation time. Relaxation. Peace. When you're ready, you may even observe your breath. Breath coming in, breath going out. Breathing in peace. Breathing out, let go. I'm going to be quiet for the next five minutes.
How peaceful are you now? How calm does your mind feel? Have many of the thoughts just disappeared? When the thoughts go, that's when you feel peace. How does your body feel? When my mind is peaceful, the body also feels so deeply relaxed. Not, not an ache or a pain inside of it. If you know how your body and mind feels after even only 30 minutes of meditation, it's very encouraging and you realize why you would like to meditate more and more for the health of your body and for the peace in your mind. Oh no, I'll ring the gong three times. Please listen. And at the end of the third ringing of the gong, you may open your eyes to complete the meditation. Excellent. So if you would now like to adjust your body, just give it a stretch here or drink some water if you need to drink some water. And then in a couple of minutes I'll begin this evening's talk. And this evening I've actually decided on a subject. This evening I'm going to talk about fear. Because someone was asking me about this, one of the Sangha members in Perth, Sangha members in our group. Great. So hopefully you're comfortable enough now. Very good. Okay, so here we go. So there are many causes uh, which create what we call fear, anxiety in our mind and it manifests in our body and causes us a lot of difficulty and problems in our life. We used to see that even when I, believe it or not, I was a school teacher for one year and uh, being a school teacher, you can see that some of the <coughs> some of the children who I used to try and encourage, they thought they were hopeless at doing things. And it wasn't they were hopeless; they were just afraid of being judged and criticised. And so, because of that, whenever there was any type of test, either like a written test or an oral test, or just you know just being asked a question they would clam up and they would not answer because of fear. Because that anxiety was so strong, they thought they couldn't do certain things, certain subjects. And I've seen that for many times in my life, even 
know monks who I've grown up with when they were very young and see them, just, they said they never did well at school, they never went to university and I thought, why? Because they were obviously very intelligent young men and young women. Why? And a lot of the times it was simply because somebody embarrassed them. And when they em were embarrassed in front of the class, they never wanted to do that anymore, so they just disengaged for what should really be the joy of learning. When I saw that so many times, and so many incredible young men, especially because I was a monk, who could have done so well in life if they just had a little bit more encouragement. So they weren't afraid anymore, not afraid of failure. And of course, one of those young uh, people who I saw was one of the students I had in my class when I was a school teacher. And of course, every, see, can you hear okay? Okay. Of course, the uh, teachers before, the year before, they told me that this boy had come bottom of the class in maths. And I was a fellow who had to, to um, teach him maths that year. And so, having heard he'd come bottom the year before, I wanted to see if I could teach him, encourage him to see whether that was just a fact he couldn't do maths or whether there was something else of, at fault there. So every day when I taught him something in maths that uh, I would always go by his desk and ask him, did you understand that? Have you really seen what they we're trying to show you here? I gave him more attention than any other kid in that class for the whole school year. And I just wanted to see whether it was he just lost his confidence or whether just he couldn't do maths. And the reason I tell the story, I only tell the stories which work, was, <laughs> was that he came top that year. I got him from the bottom of the class to the top of the class just by encouraging him, giving him confidence. Yes, you can do this. Don't be afraid. And so much in life, whatever you do, if you're afraid, of course you will fail. And you don't need to do that. With a bit of more confidence, it's amazing what you can succeed at. And of course, the Buddhist story behind that, and I haven't told this for so many years, if you haven't heard it before, it's a very wonderful story. And that was the only TV show which was remotely Buddhist when I was growing up, was this TV show called Kung Fu. <laughs> and, when I, and that was actually the year I was a school teacher. And even though you know, my fellow school teachers you know, we talked about all sorts of stuff and I said I was a Buddhist and I watched this show and they said, it's Buddhist? I said, yeah, well, it was a sort of. Why is there so much violence in it? <laughs> well, that's all they got to show. And I thought it's the violence is what makes it sort of uh, what people would watch. It makes it sort of uh, entertaining, I suppose. But anyhow, this particular episode which always stayed in my mind was of the little monk being trained by the blind master. And the little monk was called Grasshopper, if you remember that name. And little Grasshopper was taken into this very dark room at the back of the temple. And in that dark room, it looked like there was a swimming pool there. But it wasn't a swimming pool. It just a bit looks exactly like one. And because the master was blind, he asked little grasshopper, go and take a look and tell me what you see there. And he said, well, there's, there's lots of liquid there. And at the, at the bottom, there's lots of skulls and bones bodily stuff. Yes, little grasshopper, because that isn't water in that little tank, swimming pool size. 
that is acid, concentrated acid. And can you see that plank of wood going from one side of that tank to the other side of the tank? Yes, 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 master. You will have to walk over that plank from one side of the tank of acid to the other side. And if you fall in, if you fall in, you will just add more bones to the bottom of that swimming pool size tank of acid. And poor old little grasshopper was scared. And even though I was a young school teacher, seeing it on the TV, I was scared too. It's amazing just when you see these things, how you get emotionally drawn into them. And feeling that fear was an important part of this little exercise, why I remembered it, because then he took little grasshopper outside and said, you have a whole week to train, nothing else you have to do. And there was a plank of wood, the same size, but just uh, on top of two bricks on either end. Practice, little grasshopper, practice. Because in one week's time, the test will be real. You'll have to walk over strong, concentrated acid. And if you fall in, I will not be able to help you. So little grasshopper saw the piece of wood outside and it was so easy to walk on. He could walk on it blindfold, backwards, whatever. But when the one week of training was over, when he was taken into the dark room for the second time, when he was told by his master, get on the end of that piece of wood and cross this big pool of strong, concentrated, deadly acid. He was scared. Me too. I didn't want little grasshopper to fall in and kill himself. And as he started walking, you could see he was not confident because a plank of wood of the same size stretched over acid is much longer and much thinner than the same size wood just on two bricks in the courtyard. That's how our perception works. And so little grasshopper was walking over the acid and he could see his fear was starting to make him become unsteady. He started to wobble. He started to shake. He looked like, he really looked like he was going to fall in. And then you know what happened? Commercial break. <laughs> Had ads on, stupid ads about washing machine and toothpaste and stuff. And I was wondering what was happening to my friend, little grasshopper. <laughs> and after the commercial break, they always go back just a little bit earlier than when they actually cut off. And you saw a little grasshopper get more unsteady, swaying back, was, it looked like he was lo losing his balance. And the very last minute, he fell in. He fell into the pool of acid. You know how kind senior monks are? The senior monk there, the blind master, just burst out laughing. So it's really, really cool. Poor little grasshopper was burning to death. But he wasn't. The little grasshopper was splashing around the master was laughing, said it's only water. It's only water, they just put those, those skulls and bones in the bottom of the pool just for special effects in order to make it look scary. And then the phrase which he used next was the one which was most important. One I always remember. The master said to Grasshopper, why did you fall in, little grasshopper? What pushed you in? Fear pushed you in, little grasshopper. Fear pushed you into that water. 
And that really made a big impression on me. It is how so often in life, it's the fear makes you fall. It's the fear which makes you sick. It's the fear which makes you fail. A lot of times, what you fear the most is actually what you make happen. He was afraid of falling in, so he fell in. And that's something which is powerful, the psychology of even sickness and illness. Of course, now you know where I'm coming from, why I'm saying this little talk. But sometimes we have the problem with COVID. It is a problem and you've got to be careful about it. But a lot of time it's the fear, which a lot of times it's not mentioned enough. If you think you're going to get COVID, your chances of getting the COVID increase. If you think you're going to fail, your chances of failure increase. If you think you're going to die, sometimes you've seen people because they feel they're going to die, that's a cause for actually dying. In the Buddhist, almost like cosmology, understanding of the mind and the body, that fear, that lacking that, the best of the French have the best word for it, the joie de vivre, really wanting to, to live, that can kill a person, the fear. And so we have to be one thing which you should be afraid of is fear itself. I have been very healthy over many years. And one time when I was very tired, exhausted, and there was one of the uh, parents of one of some of the uh, people who work for this place and look after this place, is Gita here this evening? Or Chippy? Oh, you're yeah, there. That was your dad. Your dad was a doctor, a medical doctor, and uh, he saw that I was really sick, didn't know why, so he actually admitted me to hospital at the time, in Rockingham Hospital. And what type of medicine did he practice? Gynecology. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was admitted into hospital for six days under a gynaecologist. Of course I was wearing my robes because that's all I have. So where's your pyjamas? I don't wear pyjamas. Just robes. They're very simple monks. And so they said, well you've got to have pyjamas in hospital. I said, this is all I've got. You can either have these or nothing. What do you want? <laughs> and in those days people were really kind and nice. They said, okay, you can just wear your robes. I wear my robes in hospital. When they, Wearing the robes in hospital, under a guy in the colleges, you can imagine what the nurses said. <laughs> Who are you? You're in the right ward. But one of the things we did in that ward, there was three other gentlemen in that ward, and a monk. <laughs> and then, having nothing to do all day, we just had these stupid conversations. And one of the conversations that the four of us had is what's, because you know, some of them have been in the hospital many times. That was my first time in hospital for years. And they, we asked, what's the worst medical procedure? And someone said, oh, this procedure. And I said, no, 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 that's easy. This procedure, no, no, that's easy. And I think, if I get it right, I, I don't know if I remember this correctly so many years ago. They said, oh, a barium enema is the worst. And this poor man in the corner, his face went white. He said, that's what I'm having this evening. <laughs> Stupid way people talk. So don't ever do that. Because <laughs> fear is something which is probably even worse than some of the diseases itself. Imagine that you're going to get injected by someone and they say, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt, you know. It's really going to hurt. What's your reaction? The reaction, you can understand, you tense up. And because you tense up, it hurts much more. That's one of the problems. Yeah, so many, you've had many occasions when these sorts of things happen. 
that there's one occasion walking barefoot in Thailand and I stepped on a four inch nail and it went right through my foot. How many went, ooh, it hasn't gone through your foot, what are you saying that for? <laughs> and I just looked at it, you know, you see you know, the one end on the underside of your foot, the other one poking up through your foot. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Actually, it never hurt. It must have got some acupuncture point, I don't know. But it never hurt until the monk with me said exactly what you just said. Ooh, that's terrible. And once, <laughs> once he said that, then it started hurting. Why? You can see just how our mental perceptions can add so much onto our experience of life. And again, that is part of fear. That is part of why we have more suffering in life than we need to have. Doing things like having talks or even somebody asked me the question from Germany. They asked, can you please talk about this? They were sort of a family trying to have a kid, trying to have a baby, but they've failed so many times. And sometimes that they have uh, tried everything and had miscarriages. Okay, I'm a man. I don't know what it's like to have a miscarriage. I'm a monk as well. And I've met so many people families have been trying really, really, really hard to have a kid and these things happen to them. And of course, having been put under a gynecologist in Rockingham Hospital many years ago, I suppose I learned something about gynecology. <laughs> Very little. <laughs> but what you do learn is that sometimes what happens you know, if a person does get, manage to get pregnant, their fear of failure their fear of things going wrong, their fear of having to endure this again, that is something which stops their success. They're afraid. That's one of the reasons why sometimes they do come to monks and we're just chanting for them. It works. Is this like powerful, some of the chanting the Buddhist monks can do? Or is it just we're encouraging, giving some confidence, see, giving some possibilities? Yeah, just because it didn't work last time doesn't mean it's going to not work again. It may fail the first time, give it another chance. Who knows? And that encouragement is one way of overcoming fear. And sometimes the reason why these things you know, give you so much suffering and disappointment big expectations, but in the end, just you think it's failure again. That makes it more likely that you'll fear failure the next time, or won't even go there. So instead of having the fear of failure, let go of the fear and see what happens. That's why sometimes when you do do chanting for people, just a blessing, so a monk or somebody they, they are confident of, when they actually come on and he gives them a sort of a good bit, bit of a boost, takes away their fear, give it everything they've got, and sometimes it works. And sometimes they say, oh, what type of chanting do you do, did you do? That was amazing. Now we had a kid because of your chanting. I said, no, all my chanting did was to take away your fear, give you confidence, especially it might happen this time, so give it a try to take away the fear. That was why it worked, more than anything else. Nothing which was supernatural, but everything which was giving you confidence. So the next time you can relax much more. And that's the same in all parts of life. You know that one of the things which many people are afraid of, and I was talking about this last week with a few people, was, I live over in a bushfire extreme zone. And we did have a bushfire there on 
Yeah, it was January the 31st. It's almost an anniversary. It's a good time to talk about it. January the 31st, 1991. Oh, 30 years ago. Yeah, it is. No, so 31 years ago now. We should have had an anniversary. Do something like light some fires or something. For to <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't do that. <laughs> but Ajahn Chakra was the upper then, I was number two. Ajahn Chakra was having some rest and recuperation down south somewhere. So I was in charge there when the big fire came. And on that day, we, you know, we had in December 45 degrees down in, in Serpentine, really, really hot. On this day, January the 31st, 46 point something up in Serpentine before the fire came. Afterwards, it got quite hotter. So, and that, that still is the second hottest day in Perth. It was actually the hottest day ever in Perth recorded at the time, but then later on, a week or two late, later, it was hotter. But imagine that, 46 degrees, and then in the afternoon, maybe two o'clock, one of the Anagaricas came to my hut and said, look at that, a big pall of smoke was rising just off Gobby Road, that's the road south of Kingsbury Drive where we live. We were all ready, all prepared, for when that fire came, it was huge. And when it hit the trees, bang, the trees went. <laughs> Please excuse me for waking you up, but sometimes when you give a talk, <laughs> when you make it sort of alive, <laughs> then actually people just, their ears open up a bit more. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they exploded, it was like bombs going off. It was amazing to see, no, it didn't really, a bit sort of sad to see how nature could be destroyed so quickly, but there was explosions going off. So we were told to evacuate, even though we shouldn't have done that. It was actually when we got to the evacuation point, the head fire brigade guy said that was a mistake, but we we're told to do that. And we, yeah, you had to do it. And he told off the bushfire guy who ordered us to. It was a bushfire guy who was scared. A couple of the people there at the time were scared too. Because this one gentleman, <laughs> sometimes when there's emergencies like this, we had all the cars outside. I said, get in the cars, let's drive off. And so one of the guys, he was actually waiting and just coming up for some reason or another. When we were told to, to evacuate, he decided that was the time to change his trousers. Honestly, I can't make that story up. It was true. He decided to change his trousers, so he came out, you know, showing off a lot, but with you know, his trousers trying to pull them up. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, who am I? Anyway, so we all got in the cars and we got to the evacuation point. But afterwards, I do also remember that Curtin University sent a group of psychologists, psychology students to the monastery a couple of weeks later because they wanted to do like a, a psychology survey. You've just been through a very, very, very dangerous fire. And they asked me and a few other monks, said, have you been able to sleep at night after this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you been waking up in the middle of the night? You know, dreaming about fires? No. <laughs> Have you got, what was it, post-traumatic stress? No. <laughs> and so they took all the reports and we you know, said, no, this is true, this is how we, what happened. And afterwards, I remember just going there and just asking them, said, how did the report go, the research go? He said, it was hopeless. <laughs> we can't use, <laughs> you can't use what you said because it's too anomalous. It's not what's supposed to happen. But I was actually quite happy about that. You were tested in a life-threatening situation and you weren't afraid. 
I think that's a lot of time what saves your life. If you are afraid, you panic, you take down your trousers. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it could have been any of the monks, because we don't wear trousers, okay, as one of the, one of the visitors. <laughs> Why people panic that much? Because the fear makes them do stupid things. Just like the little grasshopper. He fell in only because he was afraid of falling in. So little by little, one thing we should always be aware of is fear. What is actually fear anyway? A lot of the time is fear is we're actually afraid of losing something which is too precious to us. And even in relationships, many people come here, they bring their partners, or sometimes they meet their partners here. It's uh, sometimes in some afternoons or evening, it's, it's um, Dhamma Loka Dating Club. I'm being honest. <laughs> but sometimes, why is it that sometimes people, that when they come together, why don't those relationships actually last? And sometimes, I've seen this, uh, they're so afraid of losing their partner. The fear dominates their relationships and they do not act sensibly even like following their partner or just always checking her up or checking him up just in case. And what happens then is that the fear destroys the relationship. Even in a relationship one-on-one, -on -one, it does need a lot of trust for that relationship to, to, to become good. Also, that relationship to last you know, when you have that trust, and even allowing people. So now it's, you know, this is your home with, with us, so it's up to you to make sure you use it the best you possibly can. And also, for those of you who have visited, stayed at Bodhinyana Monastery, we have a large number of monks there. We're never short of monks. And that is quite strange in Australia. Sometimes people say you've cornered the market in monks. You've cornered the market sometimes in nuns. There's more nuns at Dhammasar than any other place. Why? And one of the reasons why is that it's a place where the monks the novices, the lay people don't feel fear. And those of you who come and stay at Bodhinyana Monastery or stay at Janaka or stay at Dhammasara, you don't feel fear. You are trusted. On the recent retreat, which I just finished last Sunday, one of the things which I say, which I often say to people, is that a core rule is to have noble silence. Have you heard that word before on retreats? Noble silence. What it means in Jhana Grove and Bodhinyana Monastery is we don't have any bells. <laughs> You've heard that before, <laughs> but thank you for laughing. <laughs> no bell silence. What that means is you're not woken up in the morning by a big bell going gong, 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 gong. And I often tell people, imagine that was a Buddha, and a big bell, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> he would not have got in line to destroy his samadhi. Samadhi means stillness. How can you have stillness? That is the true meaning of the word. Sometimes people say concentration. It doesn't mean concentration, it means stillness. Anyway. So when we have that stillness there, the noise disturbs it. Why do we have to have bells? Because we, we don't trust people to get up at the right time. We don't trust people to come to lunch or breakfast at the right time. My goodness, when you only have one meal a day, you know what time lunch is. <laughs> <laughs> you never miss that. The same as breakfast, if there's breakfast on. You don't need bells. 
Well, yeah. If any of you have been over to Dhammasara or Bodhinyana Monastery, we have all these, these birds out there, the parrots and the magpies and goodness knows what else. They know exactly the time when the food is available. And people have got a bigger brain than the birds. Some of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, all of you. So what that really means, why do people do that? Because fear and control. Do you like being controlled? How does it feel, you know, to be controlled by people? How do you exert that control so people are willing to be controlled by you? Fear. If you don't come on time, you'll be in big trouble. If you don't come on time, things will go wrong. And at that point, any Thai people here today? Any Thais? Okay. This is a great story of Ajahn Sing Tong. Because somebody asked me just the last day of the retreat, can you tell a couple of stories about this Thai forest monk called Ajahn Sing Tong? He died some years ago. But he was a young monk with a very fierce monk called Ajahn Mahabua. Ajahn Mahabu was a well-known meditator, but very, very strict, probably the strictest of the monks in the time when I was a young monk. And so he had a very strict rule in his monastery. If any monk missed the morning meeting, if they didn't come for the chanting and meditation in the morning, that meant they could not go on the arms round. If they didn't go on the arms round, they couldn't eat that day. They had to fast. So anyway, this Ajahn Sing Tong, he got up late, he slept in, and he thought, oh my goodness, the meeting has already started in the morning. That means I will not be able to join the meeting, I will not be able to go on arms round, that means I will have to fast today. Ah, what should I do? An important thing, with religions like Buddhism, we call it a religion, is it's always innovative. Use your insight. There's always another possibility, somehow or other. So what he did, you now he was a, a local lad. You know, in those days, you know, you, the forest is all around you. This was, when was this, 1970-something? The forest was all around you. So he went into the forest, and in the morning, he managed to find a forest chicken. And he grabbed it. Now some of the things you see over there was really amazing. There was one of these, I never saw this, but the other monks I grew up with, they saw this, so it's real. There was, you know, when monks were sitting, a cobra, a king cobra, came in to the hall. And it was actually not trying to attack anybody, it was just basically didn't know where it was going, and started moving. And this monk grabbed it. That's what he used to do when he was uh, a lay person. He was a snake catcher. He grabbed it. It's amazing to see that. But anyway, that's not recommended. Please don't practice these things at home. <laughs> and, but this, uh, <laughs> uh, at this particular time, the, uh, where was I going with this one? Ajahn Sing Tong, yes. He managed to capture a chicken. Chicken's much safer to capture than a, than a snake. Captured a chicken. He had a rope. and He tied the rope around the chicken's neck and pulled the chicken to the hall. You wonder, why is he doing that? The punchline is coming in a moment. As he was, <laughs> as he was dragging the chicken, the chicken was making a lot of noise, as chickens would do as you would do if you'd been dragged to the hall early in the morning. <laughs> Poor chicken. And as soon as it got to the hall, then Ajahn Sing Tong let the chicken go. But everybody heard that noise. And then after the, the meeting was finished, they were about to go in arms round. Ajahn Mahabur said, you came late. You can't go in arms round. And this monk said, no, 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 no. He said, Ma Gon Gai. 
which is a Thai word, it's an, it's an idiom. He said, no, I came before the chicken. <laughs> like what we're saying is before cock crow, which means you got up very early. And it was the idiom meant he got up so early because he came before the chicken crows. <laughs> okay, you managed to get it somehow or other. <laughs> and all the monks laughed. <laughs> And even Ajahn Mahabur laughed, okay, you can come on Armstrong, is that innovative? But if you're afraid, you can never have innovation. If you're afraid, what will people think of me? Innovation cannot live in such an environment. And so not controlling people is actually very helpful for having peace, happiness, and a sense of being welcome being part of a community. If you always feared what other people think of you, then of course that fear will stop you performing well in your meditation or in life. So that's one of the reasons why fear just creates so much lack of goodness, achievement, feeling welcome in life. And you can't really contact a person, you know, even sort of physically, emotionally, if there's too much fear inside of you. Even, I say, going to prisons, many years I spent in jail, actually not years spent, well, maybe hours spent in jail, because I had to go visit there, teaching the meditation and stuff. I wasn't a convict. <laughs> <laughs> I better be careful what I say. But anyway, many times going into the jails, you saw many, many very violent people and many of those people who were violent was because they were afraid. You didn't have to look very deeply inside of them to actually to give them some friendship. And I do recall many of the stories, some of these prisoners were very, very strong, much stronger than I was. And even though that sometimes you had to be with another prison officer, one of the times I was teaching meditation, the prison officer fell asleep. You know what it's like to meditate sometimes. So the prisoners could have attacked me very easily. And there was one situation where, when I went into the jail, the senior officers, they took me aside and said, there's been many assaults, I mean male-on-male -male rapes. And they said, that be many of the prisoners got nothing to lose. So they gave me a little biro pen. So please put this in your pocket. If ever you get attacked, please press the pen and it will be an alarm. It will come and save you. Please put it in your pocket. At which point I said to the prison officers, I'm a monk, I don't have any pockets. <laughs> I just hold it in your hand or something. So when I went into my class, the prisoners saw that pen. I said, oh, you've got one of those security alarms too, have you? And they said to me, do you think that you could press that pen before we jumped you and assaulted you? And I was honest with them, because they were actually, believe it or not, honest with me. I said, no, I wouldn't be quick enough. No, you would not be. We could get you before you even thought of pressing that pen. But then, the head, that prisoner who asked the question stopped and paused and smiled at me. He said, but, you know, we like you in this jail. You've given us so much kindness that there's a few of us in front here and if anyone's in the back, try that on you. We'd grab them first. And I must admit, from that time on, actually even beforehand, I felt so safe in that prison, simply because I had been kind. The kindness is a great uh, protection from all fear. A lot of times, it relaxes us. Kindness can relax the body, it can also relax your mind. And when it's relaxed, you don't feel afraid. And the last snake story before I finish 
was the story of my own preceptor. My preceptor was a very senior monk in Thailand. And he said that, I never realized that part of his training, of all monks and nuns trainings in Thailand, was meditation. And he told me that he would meditate in a coconut grove. And he said once he had a nice deep meditation in a coconut grove. And that when he came out of the meditation, he saw a snake coiled up in his lap. Now what would you feel if you came out of meditation at eight o'clock and you find a big snake could be coiled up in your lap? How would you react? <laughs> and this monk, he was, was my preceptor and he became the acting Sangharaja of Thailand with lots of responsibility. And this coconut grove was in, in the island of Got Samoy, when that was not a famous place where tourists went to. That was his, his hometown in there. But he said the amazing thing was, he was so peaceful, when he came out and opened his eyes, he saw the, the snake in his lap, called up, very happy, and he had no fear at all. And that was really surprising to him. He thought, how can this happen, no fear? And of course he just watched the snake for about 10 or 15 minutes and then the snake just uncoiled and just slithered away with, you can imagine, gratitude simply because he had no fear. If he had fear, maybe the animal would have sensed that and had bitten him. Because he was no fear, he was perfectly safe. If ever you had occasions like that know that in your life you haven't had any fear at all, you've seen someone come up to you was very dangerous or an animal come up was very dangerous and you find your confidence actually saved you from injury. Many times I've seen that happen and many times you see wondrous things happen when you don't have that fear. Wondrous things happen like animals come up to you and they're not afraid at all. One of the Anagarikas was sitting over in the area of Jhana Grove some years ago, sitting very peacefully but with his eyes open and an emu came up to him. And I've seen emus before but they're always this very scary animal, no they're scared, they run all over the place. But this monk, or monk-to-be one day, he was sitting there perfectly, not perfectly still, he had his eyes open but really calmly. And the emu had never seen a human being like this before. So the emu came right up to him. The, the Anagarika never moved. And the emu just put its beak on this Anagarika's nose. Like, almost like a kiss, just a minute, what is this? <laughs> Have you ever been kissed on the nose by an emu? <laughs> a wild one, they, you know, not sort of tamed or anything. And of course then the emu just very hopped away just very gracefully and, and, and calmly. It's so wonderful when you don't have fear. The animals don't have fear against you. And you can walk very peacefully and calmly through life. So fear is a problem. To overcome that fear, relax. Do more meditation, make your mind peaceful. And you find the fear gets less and less and less and find that you're very safe in life, much safer than you thought. And it means you have monasteries where people feel safe being there, which means that they don't feel tense all the time. We don't feel tense, you don't make so many mistakes. Okay, so that's it. I want it, can I tell a joke? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Is well one of the main jokes about the the man. Have you ever been to the to the autopsy rooms? You haven't. Well, is this 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 uh, coroner was was called into the to look at one of these um, dead people because the dead person would you be scared? But anyway, the dead person had been was uh, had a big smile on his face. 
And that's really rare to see someone who's dead with a big smile on their face. So they asked what was the cause of death? And it was even more strange because the cause of death he'd been struck by lightning. Why was he smiling? They said because he thought he was having his photograph taken. <laughs> okay, come on, you can laugh. <laughs> okay, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay, another thing not to try at home. <laughs> okay, we've got a few questions here, so let's see what we've got. Very good. Thank you. Seven questions. Okay, I'm going to do number seven first of all. Jurgen from USA. I feel fear when I'm in a difficult situation. How can I avoid blaming myself for feeling fear and therefore making my situation worse? Yeah, you're afraid of being afraid. So one of the nice things to do is with fear, it means you've got nothing really, nothing to lose. It's a nice thing about being a monk. Don't own anything. What have you got to lose? So, same if I die. Imagine if you die in an aircraft explosion. It's much better than cancer, isn't it? I say why it's better than cancer. This is one of the reasons why. <laughs> I told a story years ago about um, if you die in an aircraft explosion, when I up in to get shot down or something, there are three benefits. The three benefits of dying at thirty thousand feet up in the air. The first benefit, it's you know, it's an instant death. So there's no pain or no problem there at all. It's bang and that's it. So it's pain free. Number two, it's instant. That's actually four benefits. Instant cremation. Oh, come on, be realistic. Sometimes, you know, there's a backlog of people needing to be sort of cremated. I've seen that happen, because I know many cremations, and we can't do it today. We have to do it sort of on Monday or Tuesday or something, public holiday or whatever. This is done on the spot. Number three, you know, what do you, what do, you do with the ashes? This is a big problem we're just talking about even today over in Bodhinyana Monastery. All the spaces in the wall are getting full, and sometimes in the ground there's no place to put your ashes. You think, oh, what are we going to do next? But if it's an aircraft explosion, your ashes are scattered automatically. <laughs> and the best, the best part of this, oh no, it's actually two more <laughs> benefits. <laughs> Keep your memory as I go along. Honestly, how expensive are funerals? This is not just for free. It is, you get money back from this. <laughs> With the insurance, the aircraft company gives you a, a big compensation. But the best part of it, not the finances, finances are so worldly. Spiritually. Spiritually, imagine, dying at 30,000 feet. You're so close to heaven. It's easy <laughs> to go the rest of the way. <laughs> so why are people being afraid of being blown up in the air? <laughs> so difficult situation, the fear makes it more difficult. So how do you avoid blaming yourself? Oh look, don't blame yourself for anything. You can actually blame, you know, your teachers, blame your parents, blame your culture, they're not teaching you just how to be more peaceful in life. In other words, a difficult situation, how can I avoid blaming myself? It just, live in the present moment, let go of the fear, you have nothing to lose. My son is finishing high school, he is bright but worried about his future, but he's not going to make it. He thinks college fee will put burden on his mum, I try to encourage them that everything will be fine. Any advice? Thank you. Think of all the people who didn't get to university or dropped out, including Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, uh, Bill Gates. These are all billionaires. 
So maybe sending your son to university will stop him from becoming a billionaire. And then you'll have to work, your parents will have to work for the rest of their life. That's true, you know. So see the positive side about his bright worries about his future. Poor son. I don't know, he's, he's just finishing high school. He's already starting to worry about his future. He's not going to make it. Look, tell your son if he doesn't make it, he can have a wonderful life. I know many monks over in Indonesia. I could find you a place in their monasteries. Mm. <laughs> so you could be happy ever after without having to worry about passing more exams. Isn't it the case you pass one exam, you have to do, an, do another one later on? There's no end of them. So if you fail your exams early on in your life, you're much more free. <laughs> Parents hate me saying things like that. To this <laughs> you never heard that, did you, Shanti? No, you didn't hear that about <laughs> failing exams. Edi from Indonesia. For five precepts, number one precept is do not kill. What is the view of, view of what is the Buddha view on being a vegetarian? If someone goes to a restaurant and chews those living sea animals, that person ordered the killing for eating. Is that considered killing? Yeah, it is considered killing if you go and order those live animals in the restaurants. That's why, isn't it? Sometimes I've been to restaurants and you've seen some of those animals in those, those like aquari not aquariums, those small tanks. And sometimes they're like lobsters. Have you seen the lobsters? They actually point to each other and say, take him, take him. <laughs> Take that one. <laughs> no, that's it's not, it's not very nice to see. So it's much better to, um, if you want to be a vegetarian, fine, vegan, fine. But you know, when I was a Buddhist, uh, the last year before I left university, I asked my friends, "How did you feel about me being a Buddhist when you weren't?" And they said, "We respected you." He respected me because I never told anyone to be a Buddhist. I was a, actually a vegetarian at that time. And I never told anyone else to be a vegetarian. I didn't drink alcohol. I never told anyone else not to drink alcohol. Because I wasn't forcing my ideas on anybody else, that gave much more credibility to what I was doing. So they're saying, whatever you decide to do in your life, how you decide to eat, that is your decision. Don't criticize others. Smitha. It appears that my mother is winding down. She's getting desperate and impatient to leave this world. She wants me to pray that she can leave soon. Please guide me on how to handle the situation. It depends actually what happening with your mother, how old she is. But one of the most beautiful times of my monastic life was being with people and seeing someone really, really suffering and telling their closest relations, their loved ones, have you told your mother, or have you given your mother permission to die yet? So you go up to your mum, or your dad, your loved one, your husband, your wife, or whatever, and say, it's okay to die. I give you permission. Don't feel you're going to keep on struggling to be alive for the sake of me. I don't want you to suffer anymore. I've seen that so many times, being on people's bedsides, and getting the wife to go up to the husband and give him permission to go. And it's a very beautiful, a very emotional, very sensitive. It's from cases like that, I always say the greatest act of love is to let someone go with your blessing. But also against that, you have sometimes surprising results from giving people permission to go. Like this young Rhodes scholar who I grew up with in Thailand. He was so fit and so smart and he was like a wrestler but also uh, a Rhodes scholar means you go to Oxford University. Really smart fellow. But when he was in Thailand he got really, really sick, very close to death. We sent him over to our monastery in England thinking that might be of service to him, help him. But he just was in his room for about two or three years without being able to get out of his room. Now one day, one of the monks went up there and said to him, on behalf of all the people who've been looking after you all these years, all the people who care about you and love you, I've come up here on behalf of everybody to give you permission to die. 
Stop trying to get healthy. Stop trying to please others by trying this and trying that to get rid of the sickness. Look at that, this Rhodes Scholar, he's a champion wrestler over in, he was, he was from the, I think I'm from Tennessee. He used to speak this wonderful South American drawl as a monk. <laughs> South, uh, yeah, Southern States of America drawl. And a very nice fellow. And he just wept. He'd been trying so hard to get better. That literally was causing him to be sick. From that day on, he started to improve in his health. That was so many years ago, maybe 35 years ago. He's still alive. <laughs> Once he got permission to die, he kept on living. That's a strange thing. It's actually fear. This was the fear of upsetting and causing suffering and grief to the people he cared about. That fear was what was keeping him from getting better and keeping him from dying, putting him in this terrible prison of sickness. From Sri Lanka, Ajahn Brahm, I'm having anxiety and it, s it triggers my phobias. I'm scared of spotty patterns and spikes. I always notice them around me. Even looking around is unpleasant. Please advise. Again, the best thing to do is to close your eyes and do some meditation when you get very, very peaceful. You'll find those things don't hurt you as much. They don't harm you. They don't scare you as much. The mind gets more resilience after it's been peaceful. And that resilience, the best simile I've ever come up with for resilience, a guitar string. Remember, guitar string is very taut. And it's under 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 uh, pressure from both ends, under stress. Something hits it, bing, it makes a loud noise. You loosen the tension on both ends, bing. It's total loss of tension on both ends. It's very loose. You can hit it. Nothing makes it resound. Small things, you say, like spikes or like what's the other thing? Uh, spotty patterns trigger some sort of uh, reaction. There seems to be an overreaction. It's because you're already so tense. You can loosen that tension. Who knows? But that might be able to overcome the extreme anxiety. From Germany, how can I establish self-discipline in my thoughts and actions? I seem to go back to my bad habits even though I try to restrain myself. I don't know what bad habits you have, but whatever bad habits they are, they cause you pain and anxiety and just suffering in life. So don't you want a nice happy life? After a while you find those bad habits, you're mindful, reflective, and you find the bad habits just create more pain for yourself and for others. It's just not worth it. Of course you have bad habits, but you have reflection. Mindfulness is also what creates a very strong memory, which means you can remember what you did and how these things affect you. So don't try to restrain yourself, but be learning about what the bad habits do and what good habits do. And after a while, especially as you know, if you become a monk, there's so many things you can't do, so many things you're not supposed to do, and after a while, you don't want to do them anyway. All those rules which we have to keep as a monk, a lot of them are just easy to keep. You know, why would you want to do any of those things? That's why, how I feel. I don't. Lastly, this week we are commemorating the passing of a wonderful teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. Could you please share any personal anecdotes you may have with him or how his teaching influenced your teaching and practice of Buddhism? Thanks so much. I know that once, that at, uh, you know I used to go to all these conferences, I went to one of the conferences, I think it was the World Buddhist Summit, I think it was that one, over in uh, Vietnam, in Hanoi. And, yep, over there. And when I actually went to sit in my seat, because I was representing Australia, that I was in one of the front seats. I'd been there before and could give a good talk well enough known, so I was in one of the front seats, and I saw the person who was sitting next to me was Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh. So I was spending about 10 or 15 minutes sitting next to one another. But I tried to get him into a conversation, but he wouldn't sort of speak anything at all. 
So, you know, to me it looked like he was ignoring me. It didn't matter. He was, he was getting old. And one of the things I remember about that is as you get old, I told the monks the other day, before my 70th birthday, I said, I'm getting old. And they said, no, you're not getting old. What did they say? You're already old. You've got to be honest as a monk. <laughs> but that sometimes as you get older, even if you're a monk or a teacher, sometimes your ability to teach sometimes start to be not as strong as it used to be. Sometimes, you know, you start to wear out. And that's one of the reasons. When I saw that, the talks which he gave were not as powerful as the talks he used to give when he was younger. And I thought that, you know, sometimes there comes a time in your life when you have to retire. So people can remember you at your best rather than always having these um, come back again and teach again or play music again or fight like a boxer again. But I do remember Muhammad Ali. I was always had an interest in him because when I was only about 11, I, I met him as Cassius Clay. He's such a nice guy. I must admit that I was very respected him so much. But then, I remember just someone saying that when he was really, really old, people said, you know, you're still as sharp as you used to be. He said, watch this. He said, well, well, what? He said, I'm so fast you couldn't even see me punch. <laughs> <laughs> At least he had a sense of humor, and that's good on him for that. But sometimes when you get really old and you can't really inspire people as you used to, you should retire. And that's one of the things which I remember. And for goodness sake, all the people here at Buddhist Society of West Australia, if I keep repeating myself too many times, and if I keep repeating myself too many times, <laughs> and if I keep... <laughs> Please tell me, okay, Ajahn Brahm, thanks very much, but now we get some of the younger monks and younger nuns to take over. <laughs> so that's also that remember just, you can be a good monk, inspiring, but the ability to teach and just be able to be on the ball will decline over the years. So please, I've got a nice cave I can retire into. So when the time is right, Venerable Kalama, put me in the cave, lock the door. Bye-bye, Ajahnpa. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's enough for tonight. Any other questions before we close off? Okay, here we go then. Oh, we do the chanting at the back. The Arahang Samasambuddha.